The Cosmos Lave has made quite a name for herself in the recent years on this channel. It's done tons of jobs, worked way beyond its capacity most of the time, and um, I've been realizing that ever since I have the MyFoot now, because everything that was a big time consuming job on this machine is just done like that on the MyFoot. So in these few months, I have never really looked back at this one. And I've come to realize that I think the best thing is to part ways with it. Now, I'm not just going to throw it online as unique watchmaker's lathe, best of qualities, ran when parked, one owner only. No, I've actually found a guy, a good friend of mine, who is interested in it. He's a hobby clockmaker and um, this would be the perfect tool for him, doing smaller jobs and uh, not some, you know, huge experimental roughing type of deal. So what I'm going to do is give it somewhat of an overhaul, especially regarding the tool slide here, get it running again for him, and then it's his. If we recall once again, the reason why I bought another lathe was because the tool slide here had worn out completely. The nut in here is just stripped. You can see it's two nuts actually, which can be tightened against each other. And well, after some time you've tightened all the slop out of it and there's just no thread left in there. This is what we're going to have to make to get it running again. However, while I was using it, I was also noticing that the lead screw, if you want to call it that, is actually worn unevenly across its length as well. And if this thing is worn out, then the cross slide is going to be worn out just as well and is probably going to give in in a short amount of time. While we have the tool slide apart, I'm also going to take the time and smooth out all these saw cut marks here from me slipping when sawing things off uh, you know to reduce the high spots here down I'm not a professional machine rebuilder so it's not going to be perfect like new but I am to get it you know pretty smooth between ends here uh, I can use sanding paper and my surface plate just so you don't have to give the gibbs different amounts of tightness depending on where you work on this area. Right, here is everything nicely laid out. I cannot, for the life of me, take these two things apart. You know, I tried within rounds what is possible, pounding on the pins, they seem to be bottom out, pounding on the edges here, and I'm just really afraid of bending this part, making it, you know, a U-shape, if I use any more force on here. But it's really the only way I can try. I cannot just jam a chisel in between here and hope to get the two prized apart without either marring the surface here or bending the pins. So um, I'm afraid it's going to have to stay together and I'm going to have to find a creative way of uh, getting these two sides perfectly flat without getting these apart. However, it is pretty obvious why these things gave up the ghost. If you take a close look inside here, there's barely more than a scratch mark of a thread left in here. I'm surprised, look, there's even parts of the thread crest. <laughs> there is nothing left in here. We're going to have to remake these parts, there's just no way around it. These guys here do not need remaking. The fit of the spindle in here is actually still quite nice and it's free of any play. And regarding the spindles, I have actually bought precision ground M6x1 spindle stock. 
precision ground to H6 tolerance, which is actually quite fine. And um, my hope is to be able to machine the end here cylindrical for a short bit, cut the old thread here off, drill a cylindrical hole into this one, and then silver solder the boat together. Why? Well, the thing is, if I try and machine a piece this long and this thin, it's more than likely it's just going to be larger in the middle than at the ends. I don't have a steady rest, so this thing is going to flex under tool pressure. And then just imagine trying to single point thread such a tiny piece of thread here. It's just going to bend under tool pressure even more than with just straight turning and um, you know using a die to make the thread just wouldn't make for a nice fit. Right, so the spindles are done, they're back in business, and the next pieces to do are the spindle nuts. Now you can see those were machined as a single piece, and then here you can actually see the saw marks where they were hacked in two, and that's exactly the way I'm going to do it, to make sure that the thread in there is actually going to meet up with the second half of the nut once I put the spindle through. Matter of fact, what I'm going to do is machine both nuts in at once. So I've got myself a piece of bronze here, which is just the right size. You can see I marked the contour out here. And um, I'm going to saw it off to this length, machine the contour, and probably beef up certain portions over here. Like, for example, I want to have more space to put the tightening screw in. And also, I see no reason why I shouldn't make the entire threaded portion as long as the knot, just to make sure it's not going to wear out quickly. Work on the shaper is done. You can see that the contour is basically in here. I've given it a little extra meat up top and on this side just to have more space for the screw to go later on. And now I'll mark out the hole positions for the mountings, drill them, mount it in place and then see where to drill the threaded hole for the spindle. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So with the uh, nuts done, next job is to get these here refurbished, the dovetails. And um, what I'm going to do is, as you can see I'm on the surface plate, I will use 120 grit and then 1200 grit to first get the top smooth and then deal with the sides. Now they're only going to take a very little bit of sanding. And I'm going to take my time to really get it, you know, to sit right on the dovetail, get the pressure distributed evenly, and then just move them back and forth with hopefully no rocking back and forth. And uh, I think by putting the slide on and then going by feel, whether it's getting tighter at one end or the other, we can get it pretty close. I still have to find a way to accurately get this side here ground. I may just wrap this thing in uh, sanding paper and then go in here like that. So the dovetail meets the dovetail and is accurately supported. And uh, see how good a result I can get with that. However, first is the tops here. Well, that went down a lot smoother than expected. I've got both the slides looking rather smooth now, feeling excellent, pretty consistent all throughout the length. And uh, now I'm ready to reassemble the carriage assembly here. And uh, then we're ready to deal with the tailstock here. Well, everything is back together regarding the slide and it's still a little bit tight but uh, it's not binding, it's all moving freely, it's just tight and uh, that's the kind of tightness that I would say is perfectly okay because it's going to wear in anyways and the most important part is that it's equally tight along the entire length of the travel of both slides. So uh, that means that the uh, surfaces that I ground are ground evenly and uh, it also means that the threaded spindles are, you know, nicely evenly not worn out. With that out of the way, let's now move to the tailstock and take it apart. Hard to doubt and hard to trust Who wouldn't be hanging around your neighborhood so you 
couldn't be missing like Red Riding Hood. Look at those lips, look at those eyes, the key to hell or paradise. Who wouldn't be jealous of you? You see, the backlash of the tailstock is actually not due to the spindle having any play. That's actually a very nice fit here. Um, it's the play between the handle and this uh, bushing, if you want to call it that, which is the problem. And you can't just reduce it because the crank is riveted to the spindle. And um, I already drilled those rivets out on the slide, tool slide. But uh, on this one I have yet to do that, so um, that's exactly what we're going to do. Since the taper in here, the Morse taper, is pretty gouged, I was going to use an MK1 taper dreamer and smooth the bore out. And I could swear I had one, but uh, for the love of me, I can't find it. Instead, what I'm going to do is take some lapping compound and uh, lap these two together. Before that, however, since the taper is almost bottoming out on the shoulder of the live center here. I'm going to trim off maybe one or two millimeters of this here. By the sheen that the polishing paste left, you can see that the taper is bearing slightly more in the bottom than it does at the top, which may be down to this taper not matching perfectly, maybe the nature of the polishing paste. But the uh, fact is, it's probably adhering better than it ever did before because I can put it together like this. <laughs> and. Alright, I can still get it apart, but uh, yeah, it was never this good before. So it's good enough for the coming owner. And, uh, you know, to me, that's uh, tailstock done. I'll now reassemble it. And uh, then, last thing to check will be the spindle, I think. While I introduced the Maifa blade, I said my goodbye to the cosmos and uh, I stated that there is excessive play in the spindle bearings. And the way I determined that was by putting an indicator straight onto the chuck, like so, and then wigging it about. And there you can see there is one tenth of play easily. However, well, this is a wooden base that the thing here is screwed to, and wood is, of course, able to flex more easily than metal is. However, yikes, if we set the indicator up to the base of the lathe, and then move it, well, there is one hundredth. That's all I can give it. Axial play is about two hundredths of a millimeter. And to be honest, that's good enough. Now I keep saying good enough here, like I was going to, you know, go cheap on this and be glad if it's gone. However, look at it this way. I'm giving this away essentially for free. I'm only getting paid for the bronze that I put into the new lead nuts here. And if it was good enough for me for five years plus and it did all the crazy stuff that you saw on the channel then it's going to be more than adequate for a clockmaker who puts you know a few hours on this thing and only does light work with it. What I'm going to do is take the bearing covers off and re-grease them.
And with that, I declare this thing ready for operation again. This is by no means a complete overhaul. Um, what this is, is basically the cheapest way to get the lathe working satisfactorily again. Um, however, I would say that it is, at least in the condition that, that I got it back in the day, and um, I would say it is fit for, you know, another 5-10 years of good service, like it did me. And um, now I only have to let it run for a couple of minutes to let the grease work out of the bearing so it doesn't splash anywhere when the new owner has it. Um, do you know what? While we're doing that, let's just turn some piece of round steel to a smaller diameter, just like we did in the olden days when I started out getting to know this machine. Here we go.